it is, as always, my pleasure to talk about head shape issues, uh, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, and I did change things up a little bit because I know many of you have probably seen some version of my head shape talks in the past. Um, I do not have any disclosures. Um, I'd like to first start by uh, thanking my partners on our craniofacial team. Um, and here you see I have some of the plastic surgeons as well as my partners. Um, and I have uh, Katie and Nicole here uh, since they do a lot of head shape evaluations, uh, both before that is to evaluate patients where there's a question of a synostosis or head shape issue, as well as seeing our follow-ups. Um, and then I do also want to acknowledge Christian and Emily who do a lot of work on our inpatient service. And then similarly on the plastic surgery team, there are PAs uh, who do a lot of work both inpatient and outpatient. Um, and then uh, we recently developed an anesthesia team, and that's something I'll talk about in a little bit, um, where these are the majority of the people who routinely uh, do our cases with us. Um, I had to include a photo from back in the COVID days. Um, this is our uh, larger baroclastic craniofacial team, uh, which has now become the Phoenix Children's Craniofacial Team. Um, and so this is a, a group of people who um, include ENTs and geneticists and physical therapists. Um, and we meet once a month um, and review some patients in person and some patients virtually, because uh, a lot of our patients do have a lot of complex uh, craniofacial needs. It's been a fantastic team to work with. So uh, today we'll basically uh, divide the talk into two parts. There's craniosynostosis, where again, I'm going to talk about some of the new or I guess innovative things that we're trying to do. Um, and then we're going to look a little bit more at other head shape issues and plagiocephaly. Um, and then I don't know, this is a little bit comical, but um, how many of you have gotten on the Phoenix Children's website and looked up your own team? Um, I did this last week. And as you can see, the people who come up, uh, I'm happy to be on the first page, let me say. Uh, but we also get Dr. Stephen Beals, who's no longer in practice, Lloyd Champagne, who is really a hand surgeon, and then Dr. Korg, who does wound care for our plastic surgery team. <laughs> so obviously, we have a little bit of work to do uh, with our website team. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, the Barrow uh, Cleft Craniofacial Center has actually transitioned now to be the Phoenix Children's Center for Cleft Craniofacial Care. Uh, about a year ago, that team did move over here, so we're now all under the Phoenix Children's umbrella. Uh, these are our main uh, providers, well, Dr. Singh and I, and then Dr. Kernick joined us uh, when she uh, finished her training just a couple years ago. Um, the, the, Dr. Singh and I have a joint clinic that we do the third Tuesday of each month, and that's really just for craniosynostosis patients. So we try not to see other head shape issues in that clinic. Um, and then Katie has been doing a lot of our head shape work as well. Uh, before COVID, I had actually instituted a purely head shape uh, clinic afternoon um, which was really nice. It was much shorter visits. It was just to evaluate head shape. It wasn't really a full neurological assessment. Um, and I think it, it just gave uh, families sort of a, a more peace of mind. Um, once COVID came along and things got mixed up in terms of telemedicine versus in person, it's been a little bit more challenging to reinstate that, uh, but it's something that I'll consider for the future. So, um, as I said, this is the stuff that I wanted to address in my head shape clinic. Um, as you'll see, uh, pediatricians have a lot of insecurity about head shape issues, whether it's um, a bump or a ridge or concern about size. Um, uh, so it's nice to have some place to see those patients where you really have a low uh, sense of concern, but want to be able to provide that reassurance. So we'll start with craniosynostosis, the premature closure of sutures. And I always like to start with this slide because it has sort of the normal head with normal open sutures up top. And then as you go around the circle, you see the head shape that you get from closure of each of the sutures. And this is the front of a book entitled Craniosynostosis. I'm not going to talk about all the different craniosynostoses today. That's my general head shape talk. Uh, but this is just to remind you of the relative incidence of these synostoses, the sagittal being the most common. And then you can see the others where they fall as well. Uh, and so in terms of the treatment options we have available, uh, that really depends at what age we get to meet the patients. So we have the minimally invasive uh, uh, options, which we used to call endoscopic, although we don't actually use the endoscope anymore. So I've transitioned to saying minimally invasive. That surgery is done really between three and four months of age. That's the optimal time where anesthetic risk goes down at three months, but then the bone is still moldable enough uh, and that's why we don't do it after five months, because that's when the bone has become brittle enough that it's not going to respond to sort of post-operative shaping treatments. 
Uh, so those patients usually will undergo what we call a strip craniectomy, which is where we take out the central portion or whatever suture is closed, and then we put them into a helmet, and that helmet can last anywhere from three to six months. It's really just depending on how long they're still seeing improvements, because once we stop seeing improvement, we tend to stop the helmet. Um, then uh, there's a newer uh, modality, which I'll talk about in this talk, which is the springs. And that's something we have a little bit more of a leeway there uh, because they are an internal distraction system that will keep working. That does not require a helmet, though it does require a smaller uh, secondary procedure three months later to take out the springs. It's really interesting how some families will hear that second anesthetic session and just sort of shut off and say, I want no part of that. Whereas other families hear, oh, I don't have to to go for a helmet appointment weekly, and they think that that's great. Um, and then we have open surgery for total vault. So if we don't get to meet these patients until five months of age or later, we really don't have any minimally invasive options left. And so they will get an open vault surgery, uh, whether it's for the front of the head or the back of the head. And again, we don't use helmets after that surgery because the reconstruction is all done at the same time. So let's see. Um, I just thought I'd start with uh, some sagittal issues. Uh, just to remind you, that gives you the long, narrow head. You tend to get frontal bossing and temporal pinching. Those are the classic findings. Here's what the CAT scan looks like, where these are normal sutures, those sort of jagged lines, and then there should be another one down the middle here. Uh, and so that is a closed sagittal suture. This is looking at the head from the side. There's a normal lambdoid, squamosal, and coronal. And then here's your closed sagittal ridge along the top. And so ever since I started my practice, we've been offering this minimally invasive procedure that requires taking out the central portion with the closed uh, suture, and then we make some little relaxing cuts on the sides that basically free up those parietal bone plates to widen, and we use the helmet to do that. So the helmets look a variety of ways. You used to be able to get them wrapped for free. Now you have to just decorate them yourself. Um, however, it's challenging to get families to the helmet appointments. They have to go every week, and that's because these helmets have this soft foam on the inside that has to be carved out to allow for growth in the places you want to grow and prevent growth in places you don't. And, you know, so for families who are local and able to get to one of our um, good helmet locations that have been doing the helmets with us routinely, that's pretty easy. But when you have a family who's from a little further out, even just Tucson, Flagstaff, you know, Casa Grande, or if you get even further out, Sierra Vista or up on the reservation, um, those families don't have great helmet options. And while there are orthotists who will try, if they're not adept at doing helmets, it, it can be kind of frustrating and you can end up with some head shapes that are really pretty unfavorable. So um, along comes a strip suturectomy uh, with spring placement. And this is a, a technique that's been used all over the world. Um, and it's something that we decided to start adopting a few years back. And so you basically do a similar procedure. It's a slightly smaller strip craniectomy. And then these springs, which you'll see in a minute, get put into the gap and the springs stay in and they just push the bones apart over a series of months. And once they reach their width, we leave them in until their bone has grown across in between and then we take them out. So what does this look like? Um, well, this is the beginning of the procedure where you can see we make a relatively small incision that's right on the top of the head. And then here's our bone uh, craniotome taking out the bone rim, which is really just going to be a one centimeter strip in the center. And it goes all the way to the fontanelle in the front and all the way to the lambdoid junction in the back. And then um, this is a sort of zoomed in view. Once we have done the, that strip craniectomy, and then these are the springs that go in there, and those springs start pretty wide. So it really uh, takes some hand strength, which thankfully Dr. Singh has, <laughs> to put those in there. Um, and then uh, these little sutures are just to kind of hold them together so they don't slide around underneath the scalp. Um, and this is a picture just looking down towards the front of the head. patient's actually in a prone position. And here are our post-op x-rays. So what's really fascinating is even though we only took out a one centimeter strip, these x-rays were done the next morning. And you can see we've already gotten, uh, I think this was like 1.7 centimeters in width here. So the, they start working immediately and they're pushing those bones apart. Um, and those springs, they'll, they'll keep going, they'll keep pushing until they've reached their maximum um, width. And um, then we allow this to consolidate or grow in. Um, and so 
One of the challenges with adopting a new technique is that you have to uh, weather the ups and downs, one of which is that the skull gets lumpy. And the first few children we did, the families actually wanted us to shave their entire heads. So you had a basically a bald baby whose scalp then got really lumpy. As you can see, this parietal bone plate was just sort of lifting away. And so what's happening is we're pulling at those normal sutures, that is the coronal and the landoids. Um, you know, the landoids are going to be here and here. Uh, they're not able to keep up and remodel the occipital bone and the frontal bone as fast as these parietal bones are remodeling. And so you go through this lumpy phase, which can really be pretty disconcerting for families. But uh, we do reassure them that it all evens out with time. Um, and so here's a child with the springs in, and then the springs are in, and he's grown back some hair finally. And then this is several months later, uh, where he really has a very nice head shape. You know, his temporal pinching is much improved. Frontal bossing is much improved. And uh, we found this, this was actually our first patient. Um, we found this to be a durable treatment. This child is now three or four years out um, and he really has a very nice head shape. So that is one of the newer things we're doing. Oh, here's another patient. Um, this one, we did not clip the hair. And so you see that kind of hides the lumpiness a little bit better. And then um, after springs are taken out, um, you can see her there. This was during the World Cup, I put these slides together so you can enjoy the soccer ball. Uh, and again, here's our improved encephalic index from 68% to 76%. Normal is between 75 and 85%. And we do find that there's some continued remodeling even after the springs come out. So what are the pros and cons in making these choices and how do we present this to families? That's sort of the new challenge. Um, with, with helmeting, I feel as if there's a little more control. You know, if you have one side that's responding faster than the other, the helmet company can slow down the way they carve out that one side and encourage the other one to catch up. It's also only one surgery. However, it's super high maintenance for the families to have to be able to make an appointment every single week to get that done. Uh, unfortunately, even though this is a required part of our surgery, the insurance companies will still give us a challenge on it, and that can be a headache. And it is, again, dependent on having a good orthotist who knows how to make this work. And so with the springs, it's much lower maintenance. Um, it's actually a shorter surgery with lower blood loss to put them in, uh, but it is it does require two surgeries. I don't know if I mentioned the second one is done as an outpatient procedure, so the patient doesn't have to spend the night the second time. And we do have less control. So that is during that bumpy phase, if there's one side that's responding faster than the other, there really isn't anything we can do about that. And uh, this has taught us that there are still things we don't understand about the way sutures work. Uh, you know, people ask, why did my baby get craniosynostosis in the first place? And aside from sort of waving our hands and saying, well, there's some sort of genetic change in their dura, we don't have a good answer for that question. And so this is a patient um, where we did uh, the strip suturectomy and put in the springs, and then their coronal suture closed during spring extraction. And you can see the other side responded beautifully. Um, you know, the springs didn't look as if they were shifted at the time we placed them, though I would agree here, it now looks as if they're pushing differentially on the two sides. Um, and so this child, we actually did have to take back early and take out the springs, and we did a suturectomy of this coronal suture, and then ended up using a helmet, albeit for a shorter period of time, uh, to correct that. So there are, there are still lots of things that we're learning um, and need to understand. Um, at the time I put this talk together originally, which I think we've only done two patients since then, but they're too early to have any results. We've done six sagittal and one multi-suture, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the average starting cephalic index was 69%, and the mean at the most recent follow-up for each patient was 77. Um, and you can see the follow-up range in months there. And there was the one patient where we did take out the springs early. But overall, we're very pleased with the results and feel that we can offer this as an option, particularly to patients who don't live in an area where they have a good helmet company to work with. It's definitely though a challenge selling a new technique. You know, when I've been talking to families for 15 years about how we do our surgery to have to uh, sort of finesse um, the fact that we're trying something new and, and that uh, other centers, some other centers don't even offer the helmet procedure. They only offer the springs. Um, and so that's been sort of an interesting learning point uh, for me as a provider. So um, this is just the conclusion for that little part. The sutures are still active and will continue to remodel. We're still sorting out, is there a better place to put the springs? How do we work the force? And maybe if you don't clip the hair, you won't notice the lumps quite as much. 
Uh, so now I'm going to move on and talk about multi-suture or syndromic synostosis for a little bit. Uh, these are the children who have, you know, usually syndromes, although some of them will just have the bicoronal without an identified syndrome. Again, we can offer suturectomies, and those tend to be done a little bit younger in this age group. And as you'll see, some of them get very severe head shapes, which is why we, we undertake the higher anesthetic risk by doing suturectomy at a younger age. And then distraction osteogenesis is really where the curve is being pushed or, or where the frontier is being advanced at this point in time. And so that's what we're gonna look at. Then there are always the traditional open calvary evolved approaches. <clears throat> so these children tend to have bicoronal synostosis at a minimum, oftentimes with other suture involvement. And that gives you tercephaly or tower head or height, height in the, the head with brachycephaly or flatness in the back. And here are the most common syndromes that will cause that, though there are certainly others. And so here's a case example of a patient who you can tell has already had a prior procedure. We actually did a sagittal suturectomy in this patient when she was only a couple months old, uh, but clearly has had an unfavorable head shape. And so she underwent what we call a distraction osteogenesis. And so we reopen her scar. We then make a circular cut all the way around the back of the head. So you're basically releasing the occipital uh, bone all the way around in a circle. And then these distractors are placed on and uh, it, it had a little arm on it that came out that was turned for usually um, three to four weeks. Then the arm comes off and it's allowed to consolidate or the bone grows across. And so this is actually her picture uh, with the, the arm has been taken off, but the distractor is still in there. So this is after uh, she has had the distraction. You can see the improvement that we were able to gain in the vertex part of her head. Um, unfortunately, this is a process that continues. And so here she is a year or so later where she has now continued to develop tercephaly um, and just has not grown favorably in the directions that we would like. So these are cases in which we clearly need more uh, advances and more ideas. Um, this is that same patient again, just to give you an idea of her from the front. And this is what her CT scan looked like prior to intervention. So you could see this is where her sagittal sutures closed. Um, she actually had closure of her lambdoid sutures as well, which is what gives you this funkiness back here, as well as her, um, her coronal suture. And so that clearly, this is clover leaf skull um, that presents a significant challenge. There is another patient who had multi-suture synostosis and had already had two previous uh, vault remodelings, but as you can see, continuing to grow up. And you can probably tell just by looking that this head is very small. Uh, and so, again, underwent distraction osteogenesis um, with the distractors. Um, and this is one of the, the areas that has been um, getting improved uh, recently uh, in terms of planning, uh, which will assist in decreasing operative time. So we can not only use virtual surgical planning, which is where the company that provides these distractor devices for us um, provides this type of imaging. Um, and it's actually a, a real-time workstation where uh, we can get on with a representative from the company and we can say, okay, we want to expand the vault from approximately here back. And um, what kind of head shape do we get if we put this cut vertically versus what if we make it more at an angle, forward or back? And then what angle do we put the distractors at? Do we wanna push this straight back or do we wanna push it back and down? And so all of that decision-making can be done on a virtual platform previously. And then they actually make this 3D guide for us. So this is a 3D printed um, uh, distractor placement guide and it's custom made for each patient. So you can see once we've in the surgery, once we've exposed the entire skull, this guide, which is sterilized, is then brought onto the field and it's just snapped right over the skull. And it shows us not only where to make that cut that we had planned previously, but it also shows us where the plates of the distractors go. And so we can literally just take a pencil and draw on the skull where we want these little foot plates to go. And then this pops off and we just start putting on the distractors. And having done this, Without this system in the past, I can tell you that definitely saves time. Um, and it, it really saves time in making them straight and even on the two sides, because we used to spend a lot of time, um, they have these flags that go on them where you, you kind of look and say, oh, does this one need to go forward or backward? Um, and so this has really helped in terms of shortening uh, operative time and placement. Um, and so uh, that, that's a really neat option that we have been using just in the past year or so. 
uh, for the, the main distractors. However, the families still have to actually turn the little arm that sticks out. And then um, you are always worried when you have a child who's often at the age where they're learning how to walk, when they have a metal thing sticking out of their head, it's amazing that fewer of them actually get into any trouble with falling or hitting that. So the next question is, can this be simpler? And so you saw the springs that we used for sagittal synostosis. And so this is a child who uh, does not have an identified syndrome. Uh, you can probably tell their face is not as affected as that other one. Um, and, but they do have bicoronal synostosis. And so you still have the turocephaly and the brachycephaly with the significantly flattened head. And so this is one where we use springs. Um, and so we make uh, the cut again in a circular fashion. Uh, it's the same incision. It does require the big open incision, uh, but then we release that bone um, all the way around. And then this is at the beginning when the springs were first put in, you can see that they're relatively close together. Again, even though we only took out one centimeter of bone, just by the time we were closing, you could see uh, that, that that had already been activated. And then over time, those springs widen to their full extent. Uh, so this is all underneath the skin. There's nothing that's sticking out. There's nothing the family has to worry about. Uh, they can bathe normally and, and not have to worry about falls uh, anywhere near as much as with the, the distractors. And there's my football. I can see it was during Super Bowl, but I put this hat together. <laughs> Uh, and so here we have the uh, the child after uh, the springs have been taken out and they've healed up. So it's several months later. And you can see this is a pretty normal head shape at this point. Looking down from the top, it does still look a little bit rounder than you might expect to see in someone who didn't have synestosis, but they've had a very nice result um, from the spring procedure. And so that's something that we now have to offer not only our single suture sagittal patients, but also our multi-suture patients as well. So I thought I would just summarize some of our other craniofacial team projects um, in a little bit less detail. Um, one of them is looking at bone thickness and blood transfusion. So blood loss and transfusion rates are very hot topics among the craniosynostosis community. Everybody loves um, to, to brag about how little blood loss they have and how little transfusion they give. But the truth is these things are incredibly subjective. Um, when we're doing synostosis surgery, the blood is, that we lose is not captured in a nice little neat vial that you can measure. It, it leaks out into the drapes and into sponges. And so it really is quite an estimate. Um, and then similarly, transfusion decisions are not made purely based on blood loss. They're really made based on vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, you know, any, any sign that the patient's becoming symptomatic from blood loss. So again, these things are very subjective. And so we wanted to, to try to use something we were getting anyway, which is our pre-op CT scan, to see if there's a way to estimate who is going to be at higher risk for high blood loss and transfusion. And if you think about the way the skull is, is formed, um, is bicortical. So we have an outer table and an inner table, and then a bone marrow or cancellous portion in the center. And the children who end up having higher blood loss are those who have that thicker cancellous portion. So that is, they have a lot more oozing while we're doing our work. And so over on these images, you can see this is the bone that we traditionally take out for the sagittal surgery that's followed by the helmet. And interestingly, if you look at the thickness of the bone, Unfortunately, our cuts are made right in the thickest portion of the skull bone. Um, and so, you know, this makes us ask, well, what if we took out a little more? What if we got out to here where we were past uh, that region of uh, bone thickness? Could we avoid having to have this bone oozing the whole time that we're working? Um, and so the, this is uh, a project we undertook a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see these are the, the points that were measured. And then down here, you can see the, uh, the thicknesses of the bone, and it is thinner um, up in the frontal region um, and thicker more back in the parietal region. And so um, to get to the results from this, why are we not going down? There we go. Um, uh, here, and I'll just bring this up. Uh, we found that frontal and parietal bone thickness in the region of the osteotomy were positively correlated with estimated blood loss. Um, and so here's, we can see there's probability of transfusion and then the bone thickness in the frontal and parietal bones. So as that increased, um, the uh, probability of transfusion increased as well. And then uh, the bone thickness was 76% accurate in identifying patients who would require blood transfusion. So this is now information that we can present uh, to families uh, once we've had a chance to evaluate their CAT scan. And that's usually sort of on the day of surgery 
surgery. Uh, they get the CAT scan shortly before surgery, but then we can update them um, as we uh, plan to move into surgery on whether or not their child has a high risk or not of needing a blood transfusion. Uh, here's another project that we looked at, and this is in developing a dedicated craniofacial team. Um, so for many years, the, the plastic surgery OR and the neurosurgery OR were the standard places that we did these two procedures. So this, this wasn't a big change in terms of the team of operating room nurses or scrub technicians, uh, but it really was a change in terms of the anesthesiology group that supports us. Because um, while we had a few of the same people who would sort of show up for our cases, there wasn't a dedicated team. And so we looked at other centers that did have dedicated anesthesia teams, and we requested this of our anesthesia group, and they were able to comply with that. And um, I believe at one point we had 10 people who were assigned to our team. And so you could see after making this transition, um, the percent of cases with a dedicated craniofacial anesthesiologist increased from 80% to 94%. Uh, we also started doing nerve blocks um, with the goal of decreasing narcotic usage. And you could see before the dedicated team, we would have anesthesiologists who either didn't know how to do nerve blocks or didn't know that we wanted that. And uh, so that improved significantly. Um, and then similarly, the percentage of cases receiving a blood transfusion decreased. And this is uh, just from having an awareness of how our team functions, awareness of when the blood loss happens, when we need to check ABGs. And so this has been a really useful change that we've made to our craniosynostosis service. And uh, so that's really to conclude the craniosynostosis portion. Um, I didn't harp on this too much yet, but we do request early referrals. Um, and by early, I mean, it's ideal in the second month of life. Uh, so I, we actually got a referral for a, a child who was seven days old this weekend while I was on call. And it can be really hard to tell when you have a seven day old because, you know, babies lose weight, their heads collapse a little bit. Um, and so it's actually ideal to meet them in the second month of life. Um, Obviously, if we want to consider a minimally invasive surgery at three months of age, we need to meet them before that. Uh, but there tends to be a pretty good window in there where we can meet them. And I also ask that other services not order imaging just to make the diagnosis, because for the most part, we don't need imaging to make this diagnosis. It's a diagnosis of exam. You can often tell when you walk in the room if a child has synostosis or not. So we use our imaging for surgical planning, and to that end, we prefer to do it right before our surgery so that we have the most up-to-date information. Because if you have a CAT scan that's two and a half months old and a baby who's now three months old, that bone information is old news. You know, that, that's really not going to help us in terms of our, our blood loss uh, prediction, uh, et cetera. And then, again, evolving needs uh, will continue to drive innovation. And so we will continue to look at specific access, specific aspects of the care for these patients and see which areas we can uh, improve moving forward. So with that, we will move into other head shape concerns. Um, in terms of plagiocephaly, I think a great many people um, on this Grand Rounds probably address questions about flat heads. Um, the number one risk factor for it is the supine sleeping position. So yes, although we have decreased SIDS, um, it has started this other issue that we now have to address. Um, it seems to peak between 6 and 16 weeks of age and then drops off. Most new cases develop by six weeks and it's very rare to have new plagiocephaly after four months. As I talked about before, the skull gets thick enough and firm enough at that time that it's not really going to change based on positioning after that. Um, and up to 30% of kids may have some uh, flattening of their head during their first eight months of life. Uh, so this is the most classic type of plagiocephaly, uh, where you get the classic parallelogram, or if you just imagine this child has been preferring to turn their head to the right, which is the more common side, uh, then uh, you get flattening on that right side, the ear moves forward, the forehead moves forward. Uh, these children rarely need imaging. Um, and we ask that even if you do feel like you need to get imaging, please don't get skull x-rays. X-rays really aren't useful for anything when it comes to the head. Um, we have CT protocols, which are very uh, light radiation, um, and we would be happy to see those patients and make those decisions. Um, there is um, a role for neck films in children with refractory torticollis. So that is, if you're seeing more of a neck turning problem rather than a flat head problem, that's a whole separate ball of wax that I'm not going to get into today. So again, here's the parallelogram shift. And so I think of this as the rule of Fs. If it's 
the ear is forward on the flat side, then you're fine. And this is to help people tell the difference between unicoronal synostosis, where the ear will actually be more back on the flat side. Um, and so if everything's shifted forward, you look down on the head from the top, you can just sort of imagine that pressure, um, again, usually on the right-hand side, um, then it will push it forward. All the family needs to do is turn this child's head to the left as much as possible, and gravity will reverse those effects. This is the other type of plagiocephaly we see a lot, which is the baby who is perfectly content to lie flat on their back and stare straight ahead, um, and this baby just needs more tummy time. Um, so um, there have been a lot of people who worked on this situation. Um, this was a, a AAP grand round for 2014. Again, right side is the more common side. Interestingly, it's more common in certain aspects of the population. Um, and thankfully, very few uh, teenagers have residual measurable asymmetry down the road. So all kinds of products have been developed to help with this. And again, I don't know if you've gotten on Google and looked up your own specialty, but it can be super fun. Um, so the Mimos pillow is one where you can either put the flat side over the hole or you can put the bulgy side over the hole and it's supposed to help either one. They even did a study. Um, not surprisingly, it showed no significant difference, although they found a trend for a greater improvement for children who use the pillow in addition to the neck stretching. Um, another fun product that's just completely adorable is the tortle. Um, I guess this is it's supposed to fit really tightly, so then this ridge thing is supposed to prevent the baby from turning onto the flat side anymore. It comes in different sizes. Um, Amazon often offered me these other products as well, uh, different kinds of sleep positioners. And then this one was really the best. Uh, this person has really gone down the rabbit hole of um, head shape issues, and you're supposed to buy this whole set of trays that you then, your baby then graduates out of, and uh, there's baby in one. And they want to be sure you're not fooled by buying unproven and dangerous plagiocephaly pillows that violate the AAP recommendations. Um, interestingly, Boston Children's actually has their own plagio cradle, uh, though I couldn't find a picture of that. But anyway, I digress. Uh, the AAP just says no. Please just put your baby on the back. Use a firm sleep surface. There should be nothing else in the crib with your baby. Um, the Consumer Safety Product Safety Commission offers standards for bedside sleepers, and there are no safety standards for in-bed sleepers. Um, so we're not going to address how they're sleeping. Can we address this with helmets? Sure. Helmets do a very nice job of fixing plagiocephaly. I personally don't put infants in helmets before four months of age for a couple of reasons. First, if the parents are diligent, they should be able to make a significant improvement in a child who's under four months of age just by repositioning. Um, second, they're growing so fast that if you put them in a helmet at three months of age, they're going to outgrow by four months anyway. So four months is really a time when that head growth curve starts to flatten out just a little bit. You're going to get a lot more bang for your buck, and people are going to spend their own bucks on these helmets. Um, and so I tend to say not before four months. And then after 10 or 11 months, I think it, it's really unlikely you're going to see a significant change. Some other people on the call may disagree with me. Um, but if you still have an open fontanelle, then maybe I, you can make an argument for going a little bit longer. But I certainly don't start a child in a helmet after 12 months of age. Um, and so there are guidelines that our uh, society has provided, and I'm just going to read these. There's a fairly substantive body of non-randomized evidence that demonstrates more significant and faster improvement of cranial shape in infants with positional plagiocephaly treated with a helmet as compared to conservative therapy. And so when I'm having this conversation with families in my office, what I try to do is get an assessment for how engaged these parents are. Are, are these parents who are working full time and therefore their child is in some sort of a daycare setting where there isn't someone who's going to be able to reposition and do tummy time? Or are these parents who have a very young baby and they've already noticed the flattening and they're going to be engaged and they're going to sit there and reposition his head 32 times in a day? Um, that's how I make the decision about who needs a helmet or physical therapy and who uh, probably doesn't. So. The bottom line is there's no substitute for engaged parenting when it comes to plagiocephaly. So now we're going to move on to macro and microcephaly. 
And um, for those of you who have drifted off or not paying attention, I hope you'll come back for this slide because this one I found really entertaining. Uh, this was an editorial from the Journal of Pediatrics in 2010. Um, and I just came across this last week while putting this together. Uh, so microcephaly can be associated with structural brain abnormalities, genetic syndrome, and teratogens. I certainly agree with that. However, macrocephaly with a large brain can be a sign of genius, autism, or an evolutionary dead end. I read this, I was like, what? <laughs> when I think of macrocephaly, none of those are the things that I think of. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure what they were getting at with this editorial. It really didn't expand on it that much in the rest of the discussion. Measurement as simple as a hat size both conceals and conveys a tremendous amount of information. So I, I don't necessarily agree uh, with that editorial. Um, you know, macrocephaly, I think of much more as being concerning for hydrocephalus or an intracranial lesion. And usually the referrals are placed uh, for that reason uh, to rule that out. Um, I'll also, as a side note, comment that my head is around the 30th percentile. And so not like tooting my own horn, but I think I'm a fairly successful person. So I don't know that head size is really that correlated with um, intelligence. <laughs> Anyway, we'll keep moving. Um, there are many head growth charts you can look at out there. Um, I actually was raised on the Nellhaus growth chart, which I like very much because it not only shows the first two years of life, but it also shows you the next 16. And so when you're talking to a family about whether someone's head is big or small, if you me measure the patient, I'm sorry, the parent's heads, you can then see relative to an 18 year old or adult, um, where do the parents fall on the Nellhaus chart? Whereas on the NHANES, uh, this one ends at 36 months of age. And so I, I don't find that to be quite as useful. It's also interesting that the po patient populations that went into these graphs are a little different. So you can see these measurements are actually the same patient. And so on the Nellhaus, this child is still theoretically within normal range, whereas on the NHANES, they were above. And I tend to find that more of our um, electronic medical records and pediatricians offices are using these charts. And I think that's fine because they will then you know, have a higher sensitivity uh, for capturing things, whereas we want to be more specific for true neurologic problems. So macrocephaly generally occurs when the head is, is abnormally large. Um, certainly many, many patients are referred before they get two standard deviations above uh, the normal. Um, there can be many causes. They can be familial, they can be fluid related, um, or you can have uh, indeed true hydrocephalus. Um, here are some patients with a variety of uh, different things. Those are just off the internet. Um, so I always say to measure mom and dad's heads if possible. And it's, it's always entertaining when we get the referral from the pediatrician's office that a great, a high percentage will say dad has large head also. And so you kind of have a low suspicion coming into the visit that there's really something wrong with the child. But, you know, we're here to provide reassurances. That that's what we do. I always say compare to height and weight, and I show the families the height and weight curves, and very frequently one of those two will also be at the top end of the curve and therefore be correlated with the head size. Obviously, looking at development is most important. Um, if, if there are signs of delay and you have macrocephaly, then that's a child who's going to need some sort of imaging, um, whereas if they're developing perfectly fine and mom and dad have big heads, then you know, they probably don't need anything from you. Um, we always have to ask ourselves, are there any concerns for abusive trauma in terms of the social situation? And so very frequently these children can be followed over time. Uh, we'll usually get a couple of time points to make sure that they are uh, leveling off. But if needed, we prefer that one bag MRI. So here's a two and a half month old female who was in a motor vehicle accident, um, not ejected. Um, there was some suspicion for hemorrhage. Uh, the head circumference was up from 10% to 50%. There are no neuro deficits. And so these are the images that we have where you could see um, that there is some extra axial fluid around the brain. Uh, and when we get, uh, this is one instance where a high resolution MRI can be more helpful than a one bang um, if there is any concern uh, for non accidental trauma or if you're really looking at these uh, extra axial collections. Because this is an enlarged subarachnoid space where you can see the blood vessels that are traversing that space. And you can see that those blood vessels go all the way out to the dura. Um, and so the, there is not a fluid collection uh, that's in between the subarachnoid. Um, we have another picture coming up where that will be a lot more clear in just a minute. 
So the large subarachnoid space, uh, there are a variety of things that can give you that. This is another thing. We don't have a, a good explanation for why everyone gets it. But you could certainly see it with prior infection, chronic illness, um, atrophy. We see this in our cardiac needing. And very frequently, these will be families where there is familial macrocephaly. Um, it's uncommon to find this before three months of age, and then it does tend to regress um, as they get older. So it's very uncommon to see it persist after age two. There are a variety of different names for it. They really all mean the same thing. Um, unfortunately, abusive head trauma can also present with the large extraaxial spaces. Uh, there you can see some of the data. Um, and unfortunately, there was a rise in non axial trauma. So here's another case, the six-month-old, uh, where the babysitter reported they were irritable, and then they lost consciousness, and then the babysitter later admitted to shaking the infant. Here's the MRI scan, which shows significant diffusion restriction throughout the brain. And then over time, this is what happens to the brain as it dies. You can see the, the T2 signal change where we're just losing uh, brain cells. And then this is what I'm talking about uh, with the difference between subdural collections versus subarachnoid collections. And so you can see this is that arachnoid layer. Um, uh, and so that fluid would be normal to have fluid underneath the arachnoid, but the subdural stuff is the stuff that is abnormal. Uh, and so in terms of differences in um, the types of extraaxial fluid, um, chronic subdural hemorrhage uh, that is suspicious for non-accidental trauma will more frequently present in acute manner. So it'd be an alteration of consciousness. Um, frequently, there will not be a history that correlates with uh, finding. A, a lot of times, the, the the child is not in the care of their parent, and unfortunately uh, not with the mother. Uh, they will frequently have a prior normal head circumference, but now with a bulging fontanelle, and this tends to happen in younger children, whereas for large subarachnoid spaces, um, it will often be uh, just an outpatient referral for macrocephaly in a child who's otherwise doing uh, generally fine, sometimes with a little bit of mild delay, because when you have a big head, it's going to be harder for you to develop and manage that head. Um, occasionally, there's some irritability, but generally the fontanelles are soft and flat, and these tend to be older children. Now, just to make things a little bit more complicated, uh, there was a study that was done by some neurosurgeons uh, back in 2000, where they looked at spheres um, with fluid in between. And fascinatingly, if you increase the gap between the two spheres from three to six millimeters, then the tearing point for veins in between there decreases. And so, is there sort of a, um, a chicken and egg process here where what if the baby had a large subarachnoid spaces and then had a minor fall, which then created a tear, which then created subdurals? So these are the unfortunate uh, issues we have to address when talking about non-accidental trauma. So to put that aside now, we move on to microcephaly. Microcephaly, true microcephaly is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's an important neurologic sign. There's no uniformity in it. Again, although if the definition may be two standard deviations below, it's very rare that pediatricians will wait until children actually are that small before sending them. Um, there tend to be syndromes and chromosomal problems of uh, neonatal issues that can give you a small brain as well. Um, is that small and um, uh, very frequently uh, the head size will be completely normal in craniosynostosis and really head shape is much more important than head size. Uh, so similar to macrocephaly, um, we generally say measure mom and dad's heads. It can sometimes be a little awkward. I'm not sure why our society really doesn't like small heads. Uh, but when you do meet a family member who has a small head, um, you just sort of have to say, well, you know, it's something that runs in the family, it's okay. You can compare it to height and weight. Frequently, they will be small uh, in stature as well. Um, and that look at development and fall over time. Obviously, if the head circumference is out of proportion and there's developmental delay, this is someone that we would want our neurology team to evaluate to look for those other causes of microcephaly and, and see if there's some other testing or help that can be provided that patient. But microcephaly itself is not something that warrants surgery. Going along with microcephaly is this concept of early closure of the fontanelle. 
And when I talk to pediatricians, I like to remind them that brain growth drives skull growth and not the other way around. And so um, if you are worried about a head being small, then we always say to look at the shape. If the shape is normal, then your question is really, is there a neurodevelopmental concern? Is there a genetic abnormality that's causing a small brain, which is then leading to a small head, which could then be giving you a small fontanelle? Fontanelles close on a bell curve, so that's usually between 6 and 18 months, but we have those two tails that we have to deal with. And I always try to reassure them, if the fontanelle is small, but the head is big, that's perfectly fine. That means that the brain is growing fine. It just didn't need a fontanelle. The sutures are clearly working well. Um, it, it's only when you know, fontanelle is small and head is small that you would want to be worried about the brain not growing. Um, again, we'll often measure mom and dad's heads, but a small fontanelle itself will never be the only indication of a surgical problem. It's really head shape that tends to be the problem, not the size of the fontanelle. And so I try to tell people early closure of the fontanelle is not a thing as long as head size and shape are progressing appropriately. Well, I just have a few slides left and then we'll have some time for discussion. Um, these are just some of the more interesting things that we get sent to us in our craniofacial and head shape clinics. There are holes in the skull and we once had a patient transferred from outside the facility and lined up for a biopsy uh, for this autosomal dominant condition, which is persistent parietal foramina or foramina parietal permagna. It's a deficient ossification of the parietal notch, which normally is obliterated by the fifth month of fetal development, but in an autosomally dominant inherited manner, there are families who will have persistent holes in that region. And very frequently, if you ask the family, they'll say, oh, yes, we know so-and-so and so-and-so in our family who also have this. Um, and this is a location where there tend to be some emissary veins that go through into the skull and why those notches don't close, um, we don't know. But it's a familial thing, requires no imaging, requires no further workup. It's just something that runs in a family. Bathrocephaly, I feel as if this is something I have seen a little bit more frequently recently, and they always tend to be rule out sagittal stenosis because they get this very occipital, very exaggerated occipital point. Um, and this is just a, either a persistent mendosal suture or a child who had extra growth in the region of the mendosal suture before it closed that normally closes during fetal life or early infancy, but when it persists, it's associated with a characteristic head shape that requires no intervention. If the family really feels that they dislike this head shape, this is a time when a helmet can be useful. Um, and really the helmet is just used to slow down the growth of this mendosal suture. Uh, this is that mendosal, sorry, I didn't point that out. So these are the normal lambdoids, and then you're not supposed to have one that persists across here. But anywhere there's a suture, you're gonna have extra head growth. And so that's what gives you this point in the back. And then uh, finally, the occipital spur, uh, this one um, also known as occipital knob, occipital bun, chignon, or Indian hook, um, I think is kind of funny, is frequently discussed in the anthropological literature as a Neanderthal trait and is a frequent finding among males and therefore it can be used in forensic investigations uh, to determine gender. Um, it has also become so much more common in the era of smartphones and tablet devices. I don't think I saw an occipital spur in my first five to seven years of practice. And now I would say we get a referral for this probably once a month. Um, families are often sure that it's growing, although you know, it probably is not growing that much. They just happen to notice it. Um, they require no treatment. Uh, sometimes they can become tender. I had one patient who was a hockey player and he kept getting a little um, pressure sore there. And so we took it off, you know, but it does require an incision. And then you have a scar on your head. Um, for the most part, part, it is really from tension on your nuchal ligament from looking down, um, whether or not that's from looking down at your cell phone or something else is entirely debatable, uh, but uh, that's one of those fun new things that we get to deal with now. So with that, I will wrap up and just circle back to conclude early referral from our pediatrician allows for minimally invasive approaches if there is something that's going to require surgery. And so we like to meet these children in the second uh, or third month of life. 
Um, pediatricians are very unsure about head shape and other skull issues. And so we do get a lot of referrals. And so this is something that is managed between neurosurgery and neurology and sometimes developmental peds. Um, and really the, the issue is that neurosurgery wants patients who are gonna need surgery to end up in our clinic and neurology, I would imagine wants patients who have developmental delay to end up in their clinic. Um, so I try to do a lot of triaging in terms of referrals and hopefully try to get a lot of these patients to the right place. Um, overall, we all just wanna reassure families if there really isn't anything we need to worry about or capture those patients uh, for whom there is. Very little imaging is needed, particularly for head shape anomalies, and we are always happy to meet those children first and decide, um, because if it's really a head shape issue, that's probably going to be a CAT scan, whereas if it's a developmental and head size issue, that's more likely going to be an MRI, and so we're happy to meet with them and make that decision. And with that, I will conclude and come over and open the chat and see if anybody has any comments? So, uh, Dr. Irizarry wanted to comment. We also add infectious regions to microcephaly. Yes, that is very true. Um, I remember when Zika was first making headlines, um, I was concerned that we were going to have an influx of referrals for microcephaly. And it, it turned out we really didn't have that. Um, so, we were grateful for that. But that is a very excellent point. And. Hey, Dr. Bristol, I have one question. Yeah. Um, in non-syndromic patients, like they don't have a reason to be uh, like neurodevelopment developmentally down. Um, when parents ask you, like, what are the cognitive effects of having synostosis? Like, if I treat it or don't treat it, do you say that treatment uh, is purely cosmetic for them, or is it that you know if you have synostosis that is limiting brain growth, even though brain should be pushing that growth, that it could lead to impaired cognitive outcomes without treatment? So yeah, for the non-syndromic children, uh, the literature that we quote is that between 15 and 40% of patients will develop cognitive or um, headache or vision issues if left untreated. And the, you know, the concern is that there will be cranial constriction that will not allow the skull to grow enough for the brain. Um, and so we do not consider it a, co a cosmetic procedure because there is this risk of developmental delay and um, issues down the road. So that is what we counsel them, um, 15 to 40%. Makes sense, thank you. And then what happens, so this is a question from Dr. Narayanan. Hi, Vinod, how are you? Um, what happens in other countries, especially places like India for plagiocephaly? Um, you know, I actually, I don't know to, is, is a direct answer to your question. Um, I would imagine that conservative maneuvers such as positioning um, are uh, really the, the primary option there. Although if you look back through the literature and think about cultures like um, the Incans, um, who used to, to actually make their heads flat by strapping boards uh, to their forehead, you could certainly jerry-rig um, some sort of a plagiocephaly helmet that would put uh, pressure on the side of the head you don't want to grow. I just have no idea if people actually do that. Um, so then let me make sure I'm not missing someone in between. Um, Dr. Lewis, excellent talk. Is there something on the Phoenix Children's website with the recommended exercises for positional plagiocephaly? I don't know. That's another good question. Um, I'll look into that. And that also gives me an opportunity to talk about, um, we're going to try to offer a virtual second opinion program. I don't know if those of you know that dermatology has been piloting this program where they will receive photographs of skin lesions and provide an opinion back to the primary care doctor. Um, so they don't actually have to meet the patient, they can provide that opinion. And that is actually billable. And so we're trying to set that up, the second wave of that pilot uh, for second opinions to do a head shape. And certainly part of that will be providing uh, positioning and stretching activities um, as a response. Um, uh, let's see, Ali Reza Tavasoli, uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. Is there any age-related normal range of benign subdural fluid collection in young infants? So I have to thank Katie for that uh, one slide. Um, I think she had said it was eight millimeters or less at a year. And so uh, I don't have 
specific measurements for under a year, uh, but it's very uncommon to see subdural fluid under three months. So that's the best that I can answer that question. When I did, I, so I did this, Katie, I did a talk on this um, at one of our meetings and eight millimeters or less is considered normal at 12 months of age. 10 millimeters or less is something that really doesn't require too much intervention or monitoring or anything of that nature. If you're 10 millimeters to 15 millimeters, I will tell you in my years of practice, I monitor and I don't really do much more. If it's 15 millimeters or greater, I usually do start treatment um, with acetazolamide, uh, which has been extremely successful. Um, I probably should write up all of my patients that I have done this with because it has been super successful. Um, but in general, I reassure parents if it's 10 millimeters or less when I meet them, it probably will not become anything more than a benign self-resolving condition. So I would say just to jump on that, this is uh, the benefit of having our APPs run clinics for patients who are not likely to be surgical. So th that is patients with these sub um, uh, extraaxial collections are very unlikely to need a surgery, and yet we do still have a treatment we can offer. And so Neil is asking, what are you treating with the acetazolamide? So, I mean, I think in the way I think um, approach it is that you have a slight imbalance between CSF absorption and production. And so if we can decrease that production long enough for them to absorb the amount that they had not caught up with before, and then as the effect of the acetazolamide wears off over time, hopefully their arachnoid granulations have caught up and will function properly. Yeah, and just to, back, to go back to that, Neil, um, there it is an indicated... Um, diagnosis. So hydrocephalus, and you're kind of treating an extra axial or, um, you know, malabsorption problem with this etazolamide. And if you look up acetazolamide, it does have an indication for hydrocephalus. And so you're kind of treating a transient is what I tell the parents, hydrocephalus pattern. Yeah, no, I'm not arguing the acetazolamide use, you know, obviously for hydrocephalus, it's got a weak effect, but the uh, banal macrocranial of infancy, um, you know, has typically been shown to be two immature arachnoid granulations that self-resolves at 18 months. Uh, the kids very often, mostly because they have slightly larger heads, will have a little hypotonia and a little develop motor, pure motor developmental delay. It's pretty classic. But I'm yet to see a kid with banal macrocranial of infancy that has any real or long-term neurologic problems. So that's why I'm asking about what specifically the goals of treatment are. And usually around 18 months age-wise is when clinically most of this results so. so Neil, I have a couple of kids that get, have gotten really profound macrocephaly. And so I feel like if we can alter and assist in limiting that overgrowth, um, you know, what I have counseled patients on for years is, you don't want to have too much space around the outside of the brain. And we don't want the brain to have to work hard to meet that goal. Um, and so also the babies tend to be really irritable. Um, babies who are truly symptomatic for this that go on acetazolamide are usually babies who have a hard time sleeping or having a lot of spitting up. And I find when um, I utilize this, it is a true um, hydrocephalus. It is but it's transient. And so instead of putting a subdural shunt in like we used to do, now we find using the acetazolamide honestly can do the same thing. So I think the uh, the idea that this is a uh, uh, self-limiting process is at odds with, with the irritability and the massive increasing head circumference. Those may be different entities. But the idea that the uh, uh, that the arachnoid granulations are just not mature enough, and as they mature, the uh, problem goes away, is uh, is I think what Neil says is is accurate, and the best explanation for the majority of these cases. Although I don't, I suspect not for all of them.
Well, thank you all for your attention and participation. And it is time to wrap up. So have a good one. Thank you, Dr. Bristol.